Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from. Uh, first, thank you to Janessa Smith and the entire Georgia Commission on Wellness on Women uh, team for the kind invitation to participate in this incredible and timely and impactful uh, wellness summit. And thanks to all of you, the attendees, for making this session a priority. I'm incredibly excited to be with you today and anticipate uh, that this session will equip you with strategies around advancing health equity in your organizations through a whole health approach, including enhancing diversity, equity, and inclusion, and optimizing care delivery experience and outcomes. You also hear a few stories that bring to life how this works in the workplace, including uh, in addressing people's most pressing health needs, including social needs. Now, before I get into the heart of the content, I always like to level set around some terminology. And so uh, uh, bear with me for a moment, and hopefully I'm not insulting your intelligence, but wanna review some terminology to ensure that we are starting from the same place. When we talk about diversity, I'm specifically talking about the ways in which people differ. So that could be lived experiences, culture, values, uh, physical appearance, for, uh, for example. When we talk about equity, uh, I'm referring to the absence of unfair and avoidable differential outcomes. And that requires elimination of policies, behaviors, norms, and messages that reinforce those differential outcomes. And I'll specifically give you an example later about health equity and what that specifically means. And when I refer to inclusion, I'm talking about respecting and valuing our collective differences and similarities. It refers to an environment in which people feel welcome and engaged. I think of diversity as the what and inclusion as the how. Now, as you know, our nation is becoming increasingly diverse particularly as we consider the proportion of those who identify as racial and ethnic minorities and sexual and gender minorities. Our population is also aging. However, these changing demographics are unlikely to be, be reflected in your workplace without intention and action to make it inclusive and to sustain it. Whether it's flexibility in where employees work, pay equity, inclusive recruiting and advancement or promotion, or alignment of an organization's mission, vision, and values with the internal culture employees value and respond to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Research has demonstrated that growth is impacted severely uh, when employees feel they need to compromise their authenticity uh, to thrive in the workplace. Identity and expression go with self-discovery. And without this formula, research has shown that employees of color, for example, can stagnate in mid-level careers, becoming frustrated that they never get that elusive promotion or inevitably quit. And so what you can see on this slide are not only the external trends, but how we are and need to continue to prioritize diversity, equity, inclusion. And I'm gonna talk about very shortly why this is part of a formula for advancing health equity. And this is not just a nice to have, it is certainly critical and, and it's a business imperative. Uh, it's intimately linked to financial performance, productivity, employee engagement, and employee resilience in crisis. And uh, all of you know what crisis COVID-19 we've been dealing with over the past couple of years. Now, for a moment, I, I wanna talk with you about uh, uh, Anthem and our journey with diversity, equity, inclusion, and particularly our journey reflects building a framework that exemplifies high level value statements in real life strategy and examples of how we will continuously challenge ourselves to improve our talent, environment, community, and health through a diversity, equity, inclusion lens. We recognize best practices in, in our inclusive recruiting approach, leveraging business resource groups, which for all intents and purposes are our employee affinity groups and amplifying volunteering opportunities in the community and our health equity education offerings for our employees. Now, continuous dialogue and learning are absolutely key. Opportunities for your organization, for example, if not already implemented may include leading and learning sessions, engaging employees in business resource groups and offering e-learning uh, and or in-person trainings. 
we prioritize these at Anthem. And just as one example, I highlight our business resource groups. Uh, you can see them listed here. We have nine that cut across so many different parts of our culture and what makes us a diverse organization from our African-American professional exchange, for example, our Somos or Hispanic Latino BRG, our Pride Promoting Respect, Individuality, Diversity and Equality BRG. Uh, and, and none of these are exclusive. You don't necessarily have to identify as a member of this uh, particular group. So for example, in Somos, you don't have to ident identify a Hispanic or Latino associate or for Apex, you don't have to identify as an African-American associate to participate and to learn and to be part of that family. But certainly, uh, as, as I look at these opportunities, it, it's such efforts that have driven outcomes as far as diverse representation at all levels of our organization has driven pay equity and professional development and advancement. The bonus that is that it's afforded us recognition from third party organizations, which I believe in turn has made us more attractive uh, to exceptional talent. And, and I defined equity earlier, but allow me to further describe health equity. Health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And it requires we give resources where and when they are needed. And I truly believe that the only way that we are going to advance health equity is through and hit that bullseye is through diversity and inclusion. And hence why I emphasize diversity and inclusion as a key component of us advancing health equity. And I love this illustration by the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation. I think it really underscores why health equity is not just a social and moral imperative, but also a business imperative. Certainly as we look at equality on the top, you'll see that if we give everybody the same resource, the same bike, regardless of whether they are small, tall, or um, differently abled, uh, you can see that there are some who are gonna have difficulty achieving that optimal outcome that they deserve by giving the same resources. Whereas equity means giving everyone what they need, ensuring that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible, to achieve that optimal outcome. And that's what we're striving for uh, with health equity. And the challenges to health equity are vast. And oftentimes uh, we think solely through the lens of outcomes, but it's important that we broaden our view to those drivers of health that lead to those downstream poor health outcomes. Take, for example, chronic diseases, whether we're thinking about diabetes or heart disease or cancer or chronic mental health disorders or even COVID-19, for example. Certainly, as I think about COVID-19, as we started early in the pandemic to talk about cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, the narrative was that they were occurring more frequently amongst those who identified as a minority or those who had chronic diseases. But what it failed to do early in the narrative was to describe those social drivers of health that led to those poor downstream outcomes, such as unsafe or overcrowded housing, uh, lack of transportation, lack of access to high quality care, food insecurity. We think about the conditions that also portend those social drivers, and we think about poverty and racism and discrimination, all the other isms uh, that can contribute to those conditions of social drivers. And this is costly. It's not only costly uh, to those members and to those people uh, who, are, who are facing them, facing these social drivers of health. It's also costly to employers, costly to insurers, costly to businesses. And this is incredibly important that we think about these social drivers because the majority of someone's health and well-being is not what happens in the emergency department or happens in the hospital or the, or the clinic, but it happen, what's happening where people spend most of their time in communities, in workplaces, in homes. And so it's incredibly important that we think through this lens of addressing the social drivers and the upstream drivers of health as well. And COVID-19 reaffirmed that everyone needs help at some time. Uh, certainly, as we think about uh, our workforce, 70% of the American workforce during COVID-19 felt burnt out. One in 10 Americans say they didn't feel as though they recover financially after COVID. And 40% of American households uh, are more food insecure. And we took the initiative to look at our own workforce to better understand the barriers, particularly social drivers of health amongst uh, our own employee workforce. 
And we, what we heard was that one in three were concerned about inconsistent transportation, one in five concerned about food insecurity. And even just taking the initiative to take this survey, again, increased our engagement with our employees around these issues. One testimony was that uh, one associate said, thank you for caring enough to send us this survey. It's, it says so much about your genuine concern for your employees. And not only did we listen and do survey, but we actually took action uh, for a new benefit design and putting together what we call life essentials kits, addressing those nutritional food insecurity needs, childcare needs, and transportation needs. And what we saw was a difference in the care delivery and care experience. Uh, we saw a 10.6% reduction in costs, 15% decrease in emergency room visits, and an increase in productivity at work as a result of just listening and then taking action based on what we heard. Now, let me take a step back for a moment because it's incredibly important that you understand uh, how we approach health. You know, we have an, an uh, a really lofty ambition of improving the health of humanity and becoming a trusted lifetime health partner, not just healthcare partner, but again, emphasizing the importance of health, thinking outside of what happens in the hospitals and clinics and the emergency departments to really centering whole health in which we address those physical needs. Yes, those clinical needs that occur and that get acted upon through our walls of healthcare, but also thinking outside to what happens in addressing those social needs behavioral needs, and even the pharmacy needs of our associates, our members or consumers in the communities in which they reside. But importantly, this whole health, this approach to whole health is really anchored on an advancing health equity, which as I said, is ensuring that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy uh, as possible. Now for a moment, I wanna give you some concrete examples in how we are, helping our associates, our consumers, our communities to address unmet social needs, to both identify and address unmet social needs. And this goes beyond just point solutions. One example of this is our community connected care solution. This is an end-to-end -end solution that not only allows us to identify uh, social needs and social risk amongst those whom we serve, but to then meet the person where they are in addressing those needs in the way they need that addressed, while also keeping their healthcare provider as a key ingredient into closing those needs and ensuring that they are in the loop as this directly impacts the care that they receive as well. And, you know, I, I like to center all of our work around true member stories, and it brings to life uh, what we do each and every day. This is a story from one of our members uh, in Kentucky. And just to summarize, this, this member in Kentucky had been part of our Community Engagement Navigator program there for some time. It's, it had built a trusted uh, relationship. And it was because of this trusted relationship and addressing some of the members' uh, social and unmet social needs that she felt comfortable in reaching out to the navigator and saying, look, I just got this time-sensitive tax delinquent bill and I'm at risk of losing my home, can you help? To make a long story short, we were able to connect her with resources to uh, pay off this, this tax delinquent bill that put her at risk for losing her home quite soon. And in this, what you're seeing here is a card that she wrote uh, to our team. Uh, and, and the longer story was that she, her question was, well, why would you do this? Why is Anthem, would you take the time to address my concern about a tax delinquent bill that didn't have anything that to directly do with my health care or delivery of my health care. And again, if we are going to be driving whole health, we have to take the whole person and all of their needs into consideration because it truly is part of their health journey. And I really enjoy this uh, card that really speaks to how this meets uh, the members where they are and we're able to meet their needs. For a moment, I also want to take a pivot to how we meet physical and behavioral needs. And I'll use the example of maternal and child health. All of you know that there is a maternal and infant health crisis. And particularly we are seeing disparities that are disproportionately impacting women of color across the nation. 
And this chart will likely be no surprise to you as we look at the key maternal infant health disparities. And it's most striking amongst uh, Black people. As we look at mortalities, we look at preterm births, babies born in low birth weight, infant mortality, these disparities are most striking amongst women of color. And if I, for example, give you, or for a moment, give you an insight into how we think, even outside of non-traditional means of care delivery, and give you the example of our doula experience. Many of you know, doulas are non-clinical providers who provide support during pregnancy, labor, delivery, and postpartum. And we conducted pilots uh, in Florida, California, and New York, and demonstrated that use of doulas uh, carried more pregnancies to term, attended, uh, our, our members attended more postnatal visits, and they had fewer C-sections than those who did not have a doula. Now, I'd also like to point out that we view doulas as being part of our extended care network. And so it's also critically important that we are partnering alongside our obstetrician gynecologist colleagues and uh, other parts of our care team. But this gives you one example of how thinking outside the box and utilizing even what are considered non-traditional providers have helped us to improve care while also centering the community's voices in the solution making. Now also, we know that there are striking health disparities amongst se sexual and gender minorities. And we think about our LGBTQ plus community. And they often face uh, unanticipated obstacles to navigating their healthcare journey. And that can manifest as care avoidance or increased risk for certain conditions and, and certainly health disparities. You know, five in 100 Americans identify as LG within the LGBTQ community. And they face discrimination and disrespect that can lead to uh, many health disparities, whether it be in cancer or cancer screening or uh, uh, other diseases such as obesity and being overweight, and certainly in the care of HIV and sexually transmitted infections, as well as behavioral health issues. This must change, and we can be a part of that solution. We certainly have exemplified um, how we center our members, our associates, our community's voices in one of our offerings, and that is inclusive care, where really we are taking a whole health approach to addressing the barriers um, in the care journey for those who identify as LGBTQ+. You know, I'm running through this pretty quickly. I only have 30 minutes with you, and I sincerely hope that, that you're generating some questions that I can answer for you during the Q&A period. But lastly, I really wanna talk about how we are centering pharmacoequity. And for those of you who may be unfamiliar with this term, it refers to ensuring that everyone has access and can utilize evidence-based therapies equitably. And that cost is not an access or not a barrier to them receiving that. And so for a moment, I'd like to talk about how we're doing that as well. You know, I think about medication adherence. And it's one of the biggest barriers to people achieving that optimal outcome. So achieving, uh, getting their healthiest uh, outcome, especially if they're facing chronic diseases. And poor medication adherence is associated with lower success rates for treatment to targets, adverse clinical outcomes, higher overall mortality, and intensification of medical therapy. You know, one of our offerings, particularly when we think about uh, how we make uh, prescriptions more accessible, one key factor is promoting and promoting medication adherence and leveraging, we leverage Zip Drug and improving our member experience as well. And in this program, members are matched with participating neighborhood pharmacies that review medications and challenges. We can hand deliver prescriptions when most convenient. We individually and label them so they're in plain language and easy to follow. And we've noted that this intervention has increased uh, medication adherence as we look at one example of those who are facing hypertension, increased medication adherence amongst those who have high cholesterol, and increased medication amongst those patients who have diabetes. But also, again, this is a whole health approach. And so we are in the amidst doing those things, screening members for unmet social needs. We're doing this through our pharmacy intervention as well. 
And one example is that even in the first two weeks of implementing this program of screening, we uh, uh, identified, uh, we completed over 529 assessment just in two weeks. And now we're well over 2000. And uh, we identified 348 barriers that were identified and also resolved. You know, you may not be surprised by some of the common barriers that were identified, including medication costs, provider access, transportation. I alluded to some of those things earlier when I talked about the upstream drivers of health housing concerns, social isolation, mental health needs. But we were able to connect those people to close the gaps on those needs through case management, through uh, issue resolution, by referrals to the services that the, that the members needed. And I'll give you one story. Again, I, I love stories because it really brings to life what we're doing day in and day out to meet members' needs. This is Joe, and this is a representative picture of Joe. Uh, a 64 year old male who is non adherent to cholesterol medication. And um, his wife um, was living in a nursing home. And what we identified through the screening is that he faced social isolation, uh, particularly not having a social network, his wife also being in a nursing home, housing insecurity, and he was having difficulty adhering to and having access to his medications. So we connected him with home delivery, we got him connected with uh, low income housing assistance. And we ensured that he had recreational uh, activities through uh, senior recreation that we connected him with with Aunt Bertha. And um, he called to let us know that he couldn't believe all the resources that we were able to connect him with and that he was able to get housing assistance to find more affordable housing, which made a significant impact uh, on his quality of life. You know, that just gives you an example of how we are taking a whole health approach to our pharmacy needs. But I also hope that thus far you've learned how we've taken that through the example of maternal health and uh, LGBTQ uh, community relationship building and services. You know, as I look at this uh, chart here that really is, speaks to our how we are addressing pharmacy total health through a whole health approach, um, it really does speak to across our enterprise, how we're doing that across our lines of business by centering the member or consumer experience, what we are hearing from them and then translating that into a meaningful care journey that both identifies their needs, uh, but addresses them. And we are becoming more proactive as opposed to reactive in, in doing this throughout our enterprise. Now, what I think is important for all of you is as you think not only about the Georgia Commission on Women, but you think about the individual workplaces in which you reside, how you can advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and importantly, health equity in your organization. I want to leave you with some action steps that I believe are vital. And I leave you with an acronym because I think it's incredibly important and maybe even sticky uh, as you leave today's session. I think about values, how you bring those, what are called moral determinants of health to the work that you do each and every day. And not, it's not just a value statement, what you have on the website, but how you operationalize that uh, in the work that you do at all levels. Certainly it's important that we invest in processes, practices, and programs that can carry this mission, mission forward. You know, I think about um, a, a late professor I, uh, uh, I had at a prior institution, and he said, uh, commitment without cash is counterfeit. Commitment without cash is counterfeit. And so it's important as we think about what we have declared is our mission. Yes, we need to look on return on investment. We need to look at return on mission and ensure we are investing in the mission through the processes and practices and programs that we sustain. And certainly we cannot do this without talent. And I spoke very early in the presentation about how we can cultivate diverse and inclusive environments. That maybe that's uh, cultivating business resource groups or affinity groups within your organization that can continue the dialogue and build programs uh, by in building also an engaged uh, and culturally sensitive workforce. And maybe it's, it's programming to ensure that you are advancing at all levels, promoting people of color, promoting those with disabilities, promoting sexual and gender minorities uh, throughout your organization in a systematic way. 
but know that this is everybody's business. It's all hands on deck. I, you know, in our organization, I, I certainly say that, you know, it's not up to one chief health equity officer to ensure that we are advancing health equity, ensuring that everyone can achieve their highest level of health, health possible. It's up to everyone. It is everyone's business. I look at diversity, equity, inclusion, and health equity in that way. It is everyone's business from the CEO on down. And certainly, if we're going to do this work well, we have to do it by leveraging a whole health approach and health equity lens. It's not enough to think about health and health of our organization, health of our employees, just through the care that they receive in the clinic, in the hospital, in the emergency department. But we have to think about that holistic lens, how we are meeting their behavioral health needs, how we are meeting uh, their social needs, and certainly how we can meet the pharmacy needs of those whom we serve. You know, it's truly been an honor and a pleasure to be with you today to talk about how we can continue to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and health equity through a whole health approach. I look forward to engaging with you in question and answer. And again, thank you to the entire team for this kind invitation and to you for participating today. Thank you so much.